all uh, to uh, this week's uh, seminar, uh, part of our Advanced Transportation Technology Seminar Series. Um, now, a number of you are taking this uh, for credit, and uh, part of the credit is attending a number of seminars on uh, transportation applications, uh, technology applications in transportation. So I wanted to let you know about some other seminars that are taking place uh, on various topics in the next 10 days. Uh, Sean Brovolt from Ford will be talking on the connected vehicle safety technology, driver acceptance clinics on December 7th at 11.30 a.m., part of the ITS Minnesota luncheon series. Uh, that will be at the Holiday Inn in Maplewood. If any of you are interested, uh, you can contact uh, Sean Haig. Uh, and he'll give you more information about where exactly that is. Also, next week on Wednesday, part of the Mechanical Engineering Seminar Series, uh, David Bevely uh, from Auburn University will be talking about integrating GPS with onboard vehicle sensors for automotive navigation and control. And that's going to be at 3.30 in this room on Wednesday, December 7th. And then I don't uh, also want to point out that uh, one week from today, on December 8th, Nicholas Guidici uh, will be talking about uh, navigation for the blind. Uh, Nicholas Guidici is blind himself, and uh, he received his PhD here at the University of Minnesota, uh, and uh, working with Gordon Legg in the psychology department, and uh, went on to University of Maine, where he's a faculty member, and he will be speaking next week same time, same place, right here in ME 1130. So we have uh, one, two, three, uh, what did I say? One, two, three, four, four talks on transportation technology uh, in, the, uh, in the very next uh, eight days or so. Anyway, let me introduce uh, our speaker. I first met Brad Astotian uh, when he joined MnDOT in 1999. He had just finished a master's at Iowa State University uh, in the area of GIS and uh, actually had done his master's on the GIS systems databases uh, for tracking uh, crashes uh, in the state of Iowa. Uh, it seems like uh, quite a number of Iowa State graduates end up in Minnesota. I don't know if there are any left in Iowa itself. Uh, and I, I can look around the room right here and I see several Iowa State grads. Um, some interesting things about, you know, Brad um, is the state traffic safety engineer for Minnesota DOT, which means he has to approve all legal speed limits in the state of Minnesota. I don't know. So if any of you have any complaints about speed limits on any particular town, city, or, uh, or state road, uh, Brad is the one you should complain to. Um, uh, Brad has been involved uh, working with the ITS program at MnDOT. Uh, he worked with the Office of Maintenance for a number of years uh, and most recently has been working in the office, uh, uh, the State Traffic Engineer's Office, and I honestly never remember the exact title of that office. It's got uh, lots of different words associated with it. Um, by the way, Brad is also a volunteer uh, fireman working for the city of Woodbury. And I still remember while he was training, uh, he, his leg almost was taken off uh, because uh, during a training exercise uh, when they were attaching the hose to a fire hydrant, they cross-threaded it. And when they turned the water on, guess what happened? It hit uh, Brad in the leg. And thank God it wasn't the leg. If it were higher up, uh, we wouldn't have Brad here with us. So. Anyway, without further ado, Brad Astotian talking about traffic safety. Thanks, Max. We good back there for sound? Good. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about traffic safety. Uh, the way MnDOT approaches traffic safety, it's kind of a, an abstract thing. So I'll give you a little definition on, on what MnDOT, uh, how their approach to safety is, and, and talk about some of the tools and some of the, uh, the techniques that we use to help us diagnose or identify opportunities to make safety improvements. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, if I ask everybody in this room what traffic safety is, I'll probably get 15 different answers, one for each person here. So if I go down to my roadway design group and I say, hey, you know, 
what do you guys define traffic safety as? They might come back and say, you know, it's designing crash-worthy devices or things that with, when, they're, when they're struck, they don't in, enter a vehicle and, and cause harm. So things that break in a safe manner and, and don't harm people. Or they might say, you know, it's putting the right super elevation on a curve so when vehicles go fast, they can stay on the road. Um, or they might say, you know, it's, it's uh, making sure we have good clear zones, or if we don't have good clear zones, uh, making sure there's a good reason on why we decide to deviate from that. So if you happen to run off the road, you got a, a nice recovery area, and uh, you don't have those fixed obstacles that might be in front of you to, to cause injuries. But if I ask a local official, what do you guys think safety is? Uh, they might give me a different answer. They might say, you know, it's putting in traffic signals. Um, it's putting in interchanges. It's taking my two-lane road that has cars on it and making it a four-lane highway. And so, you know, they might think that uh, signals, uh, four lanes, highways, interchanges, you know, that's safety to the to local officials. Um, and then if I get down to the people in the trenches, I talk to my maintenance workers, hey, he, maintenance guys, what, what's safety? I can almost guarantee you they're going to say, you know what, us getting out there with our snow plows and clearing the road, that's safety. Um, you know, fixing that guardrail you put out there when it gets hit, that's our definition of safety. Um, you know, and, and also, hey, having a good environment or a good work zone where I can get in there and do my job and not have to worry about becoming a statistic and getting hit by a vehicle, that's, that's safety. And depending on what perspective you're from, each one of these answers, they probably are a component of safety, be it a strategy, be it an approach, be it a tactic. Um, but really, when we sit down, we, we talk about traffic safety, it's all about crashes. It's about motor vehicles hitting other motor vehicles, hitting pedestrians, hitting things on the road. So it's, it's a motor vehicle crash is what we use to assess safety. And so that's what we use at MnDOT for our performance measure. Safety is, is our level of assessment in terms, or crashes are our level of assessment on how we're doing in terms of safety. And historically, we'd say, you know what? Where there's lots of crashes, it's unsafe. If there are no crashes, you know what? We probably don't have a problem. And after the talk today, I'll probably, hopefully, change your mind that just because we don't have crashes out there doesn't mean things are necessarily safe. Um, but th that's more to come. Um, so when we talk about locations that have large number of crashes, you know, that can be called a black spot, or it can be called a place that has a high crash rate. You know, and and uh, a few months ago, there was a report that came out. My office got asked, tell me the 20 dangerous intersections in the state. Well, number one, that's a loaded question. Um, and number two, you know, by what definition are we going to define, uh, you know, worst intersections or most unsafe intersections? And so that came from some of the tools that we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, the devil's in the details. It all depends on how you ask the question as to, as to what exactly you mean. But in 2005, there's a federal transportation bill that was authorized called Safety Lou, and that's basically what gives the department um, their operating funds. And part of that Safety Lou legislation um, was a mandate that says, you know what, when you define safety, when you look at safety, we want you to really be focused in. And we want you to focus in on crashes that are killing people and seriously injuring people. So these are the crashes where, you know what, somebody doesn't go home, somebody walks away from a crash with a lifelong disability. Um, it's not a broken leg, it's not a laceration to your, your forearm or your head. It, this is where somebody has a, a long-term impact from a motor vehicle crash, where the quality of life is impacted or where they, quite frankly, don't survive. And so that changed our focus. And, and in 2005, this legislation said, you know what, if you're going to use the funding that we give you for safety, we want you to go after these types of crashes. We want you to, to make an impact in, in these types of things. And that was a fundamental change for the way we did our business. MnDOT has a flagship initiative, it's called the Towards Zero Death Program. I, I could talk for an hour on the TZD initiative. Uh, if you want to find out more information about the TZD initiative, there's a website. Um, but basically what it is, it's a collaboration between the engineering community, the enforcement community, the emergency medical, com emergency medical services community, and uh, the education community. So we, we call it the 4E approach to traffic safety. So we look at it from an engineering perspective, an education perspective, an enforcement perspective. And then if a crash does happen, you know what, the EMS is the people that are going to come out there and hopefully make that crash a survivable one. And so that's the kind of a multidisciplinary approach we look at, at traffic safety. So looking at these things from the 4E perspective is, is kind of the flagship initiative and in the way we're approaching safety. Obviously, us at the DOT, our primary focus is on the engineering things, 
but we're also doing things to help support education enforcement and, and emergency medical services so it's all about performance right I talked about crashes what this chart shows me right here is that we have a um, is kind of our trend on how we're moving forward and, and, and how we're doing and you can see before 2003 um, you know our focus was on looking at all those crashes total crashes and hey let's make a difference and and let's reduce all crashes that was what we were trying to do so we were doing improvements on highly uh, suburbanized intersections with lots of traffic um, where our crash types might have been rear-end crashes you know what because there's a lot of those that pile up and we can find spots where a lot of those crashes existed and uh, and we got wind of, like anything, legislation takes a long time to, to get going, and we got wind of what the new requirement was going to be. So we started uh, our own initiative, knowing that our performance measure was going to shift to these fatal and serious crashes. And, uh, and you can see, once we shift to that, and we started measuring and we started focusing in on trying to eliminate those fatal and serious injury crashes, our numbers are, are down substantially. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with us focusing in on it and, and taking that coordinated effort. Um, but I'll tell you that the, the change of that focus uh, didn't come easy. So our main policy, our main framework that we look at, uh, part of that 2005 safety lieu legislation said that every state shall create a strategic highway safety plan and that will be the framework for establishing how you attack safety. And so one of the things and one of the requirements was is that the, the basis of that plan needed to be data driven. So you needed to use your crash records, you needed to use your roadway inventory, needed to come up with a plan that says you know what here are the crash areas or here are the emphasis areas that we need to focus on in order to get at our fatal and serious crashes in, in our state and so um, there's an organization out there called the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials it's basically the CEOs of, uh, of the all 50 DOTs and the, the transportation departments in the in the uh, uh, Puerto Rico and what are they called um, you know what I'm saying, the territories, um, part of the United States. And so they got together and, and they kind of crafted, hey, you know what, from a leadership level, this is the way we think we should go. And they came up with 24 individual emphasis areas. Um, 20 of those are tied to, to certain things. Four of them have to do with like information systems and things that, that I use to analyze it. But the first one they came up with is drivers. And so if we thought if we think about things from a multidisciplinary standpoint a human's driving a car there's always an opportunity for errors to occur they might not see something they might overdrive their conditions and so one of the emphasis areas ASHTO came up with is said you know what drivers drivers are part of the problem and should be part of the solution and so they also broke that down into several different areas and said you know what we need to have licensed drivers we need people that um, are legal drivers um, and then they break it down into areas like aggressive driving. So when a crash occurs, is somebody driving too fast for the conditions? Are they driving over the speed limit? Um, are they driving impaired? Um, if they're involved in a crash, are they wearing the appropriate safety equipment? Are they wearing their seat belts? You know, part of that responsibility in, in making these improvements are gonna lie on the drivers. And there are programs, that, uh, you think about our education and our enforcement ease, that get at the driver component. Um, we also can do things to help the drivers and from the engineering side and, and designing good roadways that meet their expectations and don't surprise them. So we will interface with the drivers. Um, there's also special users that are out there. And so we've got people that are involved in motor vehicle crashes and they might not be an occupant of a motor vehicle. You know, pedestrians and bicyclists, they're part of the transportation network. Uh, mobility and moving goods and, and services from place to place isn't exclusively limited to a motor vehicle. And so bicyclists and pedestrians are, are also a focus area or an emphasis area that Ashto came up with. The other one is vehicles. We, you know, we have our passenger vehicles, and the majority of the fleet out there is, is passenger vehicles. But we also have special, special vehicles. We have buses. We have trucks. We have commercial uh, equipment. We have motorcycles. We have a lot of different things. And so when we're looking at these things, we need to look and see who's being impacted. Uh, are they... Are they uh, passenger cars, are they commercial vehicles, are they motorcycles, and, and figure out where's your opportunity to make your improvements in your states. And then the fourth one we'll talk about is the roadway, and, and that's where a lot of the work with the Department of Transportation comes in. You know, we have intersections, we have crashes at intersections, we have crashes that don't occur at intersections. Um, we talk about things like work zones, and so 
when you throw these all together, there's 20 things that are outside or, or the primary astral emphasis areas. And as I mentioned, there's four additional ones that kind of go with, with um, um, performance management and, and crash analysis systems and tools like that. So that's more the the uh, the performance management end. So there's there's 20 actual emphasis areas that we're trying to look at in terms of what can we do to to help craft our program. So. Those critical emphasis areas, we went through a, a big time data analysis in 2007 when we developed our strategic highway safety plan. And we said, okay, what are the primary contributing factors that were brought forward based on the crash data five years back, so it'll be from 2002 to 2006. And when we looked at our fatal and serious injury crashes only, so these are, these are the crashes where people aren't going home at the end of the day. They're either staying in the hospital or they're ending up in a morgue. Um, here were the things that were the contributing factors. Uh, Seatbelt use is our number one thing. 52% of the people that were killed in a motor vehicle crash were not wearing their seatbelt. Um, behind that is, is uh, impaired driving. So one of the drivers involved in a motor vehicle crash um, was legally impaired at the time. And at that time, the, the impairment level was 0.10. Um, since then, it's, it's changed. After that, we get into some of the roadway infrastructure things. Uh, about a third of these crashes are occurring in intersections, and about a third of these crashes are, are occurring where a vehicle runs off a road. And so again, this starts getting into our target crash types. And boy, in Minnesota, where can we make that? Where can we make that improvement? Where can we we uh, make that investment? And so, probably doing some things to keep vehicles on the road and prevent them from hitting another vehicle at intersections is something. Some of the things we're going to look at from the DOT's perspective. And then we also looked at young drivers, and, and at the time, about one out of four fatalities involved a young driver. Um, and a young driver, in this standpoint, we're basically saying anybody under the age of 21 years old. Um, I know a lot of focus has been on uh, some of the teenage drivers, but when we looked at the data, um, you know, the, the people under 20 years old um, tended to be overrepresented in that regard. And then finally, about one out of five of our fatal crashes are head-on crashes. High velocity, high impact, high speed bad outcome for the people involved. And so that makes sense. A head-on crash is usually a, a severe crash. And so um, these are the, the seven areas that we focused in on um, and as part of our safety program. Now that's not to say that work zones aren't important. It's not to say that pedestrian safety is not important. That's a component of our system. But when we look at the big picture where we can make the biggest impact, we tend to, to focus in on these areas. And yeah, can MnDOT do some things with seatbelt? not especially with our program, but we can be there to support legislation, we can be there to support special enforcement activities to help get that seatbelt use, use rate up. Because we know if people are wearing their seatbelts, the probability of them being killed or seriously injured in the crash is substantially less than if they weren't wearing it. So again, it's that whole multidisciplinary part of it. And, and 20 years ago, if you would ask somebody at the DOT whether or not seatbelts were an important part of their safety program, they would have laughed at you. What are you talking about? You know, we're looking at things to improve the roads. Uh, the seatbelt things, that's the driver's problem. And we've had a fundamental shift in, in, in terms of how we're moving forward and we're collaborating in regards to this. So, how do we prioritize these things? We have those, we have those emphasis areas. Um, as I mentioned, that, that fatal and serious injury crash is our primary focus. And, uh, you know, there are two ways that we can reduce or eliminate crashes. One is where we have a large number of these crashes occurring, go out there and, and give it, get after them and do some things to try to reduce the occurrence of those crashes. Um, and the other thing is, you know what, instead of waiting for crashes to happen, um, let's try to do something to prevent them from occurring in the first place. And the whole prevention component has been a really tough thing um, for us as a department and in general for, for departments to respond to because crashes happen we, you know we don't get people calling us up saying uh, hey I, I wish you would have done something out here to prevent this crash from happening it was you know darn it my grandma got hit at this intersection you gotta get out there and do something so we have traditionally been programmed to go out there and, and when crashes happen respond to them and go out there and try to reduce them and we're trying to change our focus now and and supplement it because yeah we're gonna have crashes that are gonna occur at locations and we need to respond to those but we also want to do some things uh, at an appropriate level to hopefully not make that phone ring, phone call, have that phone call come in and say, you know, this crash happened. So we want to do some things to prevent it. And, and like anything, if you can do some things on the front end to prevent a crash, um, that, that probably is money well invested. 
Our TZD mission, um, it kind of ties into it. Again, that it reinforces this is our framework that says, you know what, we're going to work together um, and, and we're going to look at things to try to get at those fatal and serious injury crashes. And so it re reinforces that our primary focus is getting at those, those severe crash types. But I'm also going to tell you that, you know what, if we can do some things to eliminate property damage crashes and minor injury crashes, I'd be a fool to tell you from a traffic safety standpoint we're not supportive of those things. It's there, but it's a secondary focus. And so if I had $10 to spend, hopefully I'm going to spend nine and a half of it on eliminating those fatal and serious injury crashes and maybe send, spend 50 cents on, on doing some things to reduce those other crashes. So, you know, if we can eliminate crashes and the opportunities there, by all means, we're going to look at that. But when it comes to prioritization and focus, um, we're really going to put our money um, where it should be in, in terms of our guidance that's out there. So we want to invest the majority of our money in trying to do some things to eliminate those fatal and serious crashes. So we've got three things I want to talk about today that helps us kind of prioritize or, or kind of identify opportunities to make safety investments. The first one's called the Crash Data Toolkit. Um, as Max mentioned, when I was down at the Iowa DOT, uh, this is kind of modeled after some of the things that they did down there. And when I came to MnDOT, I asked them about developing a tool like this. And so I actually collaborated with uh, the state traffic safety engineer at the time when I was first hired to develop the, the initial version of this Crash Toolkit. And it's been around ever since then. Second one I want to talk about is uh, a new application that's still in kind of a beta testing version and, and we're still vetting it out through our partners, but we're calling it Road Smart. So it's the Road Safety Mapping and Ranking Tool. And the third one, which is, is uh, something that's unique to Minnesota, uh, no other state in, in the country is doing this, is, it's called a Systemic Approach to Safety. And that's really the, the basis for what we're trying to get at for our prevention program and, and trying to do some things to prevent these crashes from occurring. So the Crash Data tool Toolkit, uh, what it was is a tool that was developed that helps us rank um, intersections, segments, the road, and, and interchanges. And, and what it does, it tries to level the playing field. And so, um, you know, there's a couple ways we can do it. We can, uh, we give a weighting to the severity of the crash. And so um, the EPDO on the screen up there stands for Equivalent Property Damage Only. And so what we do is we try to normalize everything down to a property damage crash. And so what happens is we say a, a fatal crash is equal to 70 property damage only crashes. A severe injury crash is equal to 35 property damage only crashes. And then you can see how it, it works its way down. Um, that also corresponds, a lot of times you hear about high crash cost locations. And, uh, you know, we're engineers and we need to make judgments as to whether or not an investment in a particular location is justified. So um, as cruel as it may seem, we apply a value to the various levels of crashes. And in a fatal crash, we value at $840,000. Um, that's a little different depending on where you go. These, these crash costs vary, but uh, um, in some states are using up to $7.5 million. And, and that's a pretty extreme weighting for, for a fatal crash versus a property damage only crash. So. We pulled that down to something a little more reasonable, we think, um, and so um, we can also use a crash cost basis. Um, what the tool also does then is it calculates out the crash rates and looks at some of the breakdown of the various crash types and allows us to do some filtering. So um, well, when I get asked that question, what's the top 20 worst intersections in the state, I can go to my toolkit and I can say, you know what? Um, on, the, on an equivalency basis or on some kind of uh, severity ranking basis, uh, this is what it is. But then I can also change it and say, but if I want to look at signalized intersections, here's the top 20 signalized intersections. If I want to look at um, intersections that have stop control in one direction and, and no control in the other, I can, I can get that listing as well. So it allows us some flexibility to really answer the questions and do some, some comparing and contrasting. So this is a screenshot. Basically, all it is is a is a glorified Excel spreadsheet with some macros built in. But this is the actual output from our 2010 toolkit. Um, there's a listing of those top 20 locations. So if anybody wants to go find the press release, these would be the locations that we found on there. Um, our number one intersection in the state, in terms of an equivalent property damage crash, is the intersection of Highway 15 and Highway 23 in St. Cloud. Um, over a five-year period, they had about 250 crashes. So 50 crashes um, in five years. 
or 50 crashes per year over five years, so about one a week. Um, and the interesting thing, when we look at the crash data there, it's all rear-end crashes. 80% of them are rear-end crashes. And so it's a, it's a signalized intersection with a lot of traffic, and, and you know what, crashes are bound to happen there. But as you can see, we can kind of um, fold in and out. Now, if I want to take a different snapshot, and I want to look and say, well, what's happening at, at our non-signalized intersection? So we have stop control in one direction and, and, un, and uh, no control in the other. The list looks a little bit like this. And one of the things that's nice about this list is I can keep the original ranking in this column here so I can see where they're at on a statewide basis, but now I'm also ranking it within this category. So the number of one location where we have stop control in one direction and no control in the other is an at great intersection on Highway 65 up by East, East Bethel, um, just north of the cities here. And uh, overall, on a statewide basis, you know what, it's, it's the eight. But if we get down to the 20th location down here, um, in terms of that type of traffic control, boy, it drops down to oh, under 200 in terms of the overall ranking. And so that's where I said the devil's in the details. And somebody asked me, what's the worst intersection? Well, if I'm looking at just stop controlled intersections, here's my top 20, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, maybe, maybe it is warranted, maybe it's not, depending on what we're trying to get accomplished. Um, I mentioned that there's the ability to, to filter and, and look at some of the details. Um, on the right side here, and this is more, you know, I, I realize you can't read that, but this gives us our crash breakdown. So we give our, give our head-ons, we give our um, side swipe opposing, left turning. So again, it starts to maybe give us a little bit of a picture of what's going on at the intersection, um, what the predominant crash type is. Um, and, and so it starts to paint a, paint a picture. And so that's the basis of this thing. We've got similar things we can do for segments of road and interchanges as well. Um, but it, it kind of gives us a breakdown. Um, and so what we use it for is to do some network screening. So it tells us, hey, where are the crashes happening at? Um, and it allows us to do a limited comparison. So if somebody says, geez, this is the worst intersection in the state, um, it gives us a basis to say, well, yeah, maybe it is or maybe it's not. Um, but what it really struggles at is, you know, it starts to give us a picture of maybe what the root cause of the problem is or what the safety deficiency is. But there's a lot of information, you know, we're, we're getting information on number of crashes. Uh, we might miss an opportunity to make a, a safety diagnosis um, based on, on maybe some crashes that don't occur frequently. For example, we have 40 bikes and pedestrians that are killed every year in Minnesota. That number's been steady for the last 10 years. And um, if there was a location that had two bike or pedestrian fatalities at one spot, that probably is a big safety deal but two crashes aren't going to show up on the screening tool. So there are some limitations of that, and, and you know we understand that and we know that, and that's why we do microscopic um, investigations of crashes um, at, at certain intersections when we're, when we're doing improvements. So hopefully we catch that. Um, there's that ranking methodology, as I mentioned, that some people think it's good, some people think it's flawed, you know, especially when their intersection doesn't show up on the top of the list like they want it to. Uh, you got the got it weighted too high for the fatals. You're really your property damage crashes should account for more, and and so there, it all depends on on what you're trying to get at, and and it's subjective. You know, we, we try to be as objective as we can, um, but the one thing this does is it crashes, it focuses on where crashes have occurred, and um, it's pretty rigid. So we define a segment of road from point A to point B, and if you want to look at a four mile segment in between there, the tool won't be able to do that. So we've got predefined beginning and end points and, uh, and that's just the way the system was built and, and we're hopeful that in the future we can maybe do some dynamic, uh, dynamic analysis and not have to rely on predetermined beginning and end points for our segments. Next one I want to talk about is, uh, is the road smart application, uh, road safety mapping and road safety mapping and ranking tool. Um, again, this relies on the AASHTO emphasis areas. And so we had, uh, we have those 20 AASHTO emphasis areas that, that we used and, and basically we're, we're plotting those out um, to determine, to get a little better picture of what is our true safety need. So what's going on out there? Um, and, and we draw on the fatal and serious crashes um, rather than a crash rate. And there's fundamental reasons why, in my opinion, crash densities are a lot better assessment or analysis of a true safety deficiency than a crash rate because 
um, there's a pretty strong correlation between uh, volumes of vehicles and crashes. I mean, the more vehicles you have, the better the chance there is for a motor vehicle crash to happen. And so, um, a crash density takes that into consideration um, when you look at it. But if you go so normalize that by dividing by the the volume, you, you take some of the flexibility out, and everything just kind of um, molds to the middle. And so. Crash rates are good when you're using peer groups to compare them to, so uh, crash rates can be appropriate when you look at all types of signalized intersections, all types of stop control intersections, but to do a blanket analysis across your system with, with rates, is uh, there, there's some serious shortcomings. So densities do a, do a little better job of trying to get at the root cause of what's going on. And so I said there were those 20 AASHTO emphasis areas. We actually have 75 independent measures that draw on those AASHTO emphasis areas. So when a road departure crash happens, we might flag that as a road departure crash, and then we get into, okay, where did they leave the road to the left? Did they leave the road to the right? Did they just simply leave their lane and become a head-on crash? And so we can get into to some of the details on, on how that works. So how is the segment ranked? Um, each segment, we divide it in one mile increments, so, and this is for our trunk highway network because we have a lot of detail on our trunk highway network. Um, we don't have as much on our local roadway network, but in theory, this could still be applied to the local roadway networks. Um, so we divide into one mile lengths. So we have about 12,000 miles of road that we operate and maintain in the state. So I have 12,000 data points, and then I have 75 fields. So you can imagine what my table looks like. Uh, it doesn't print out well on an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. Um, we use the crash report data. Um, everything that the AASHTO emphasis areas have, we can get from the data contained in a, a motor vehicle crash report. And so. We are sole source of information um, in terms of crash classification is based on the crash reports. So there's nothing that we need to get from our roadway inventory file to tie it to an emphasis area. And uh, we use five years worth of crashes. Um, we get the crash density. Um, you know, for our purposes, we like to use the fatal and serious injury crashes for our performance, but. Uh, we understand that there's other needs, other programs, so we also have the ability to use all crashes and, and apply the same methodology. And so um, what we can get is a crash density in 75 different categories on a per mile basis in the state. So the data is divided up by the roadway type. And so what we'll do is we'll group our interstates together because an interstate should probably be benchmarked against uh, an interstate. Um, a low volume two lane road probably should be benchmarked against a two lane road. And so we stratify this. So we, just like our toolkit, we have the ability to look at statewide, but also let's start looking at our peer groups and let's start benchmarking it against uh, comparable, <coughs> comparable roads so we make sure that they're uh, performing as intended. Um, then what we do is we give it a score, and it's just a standardized score um, based on the crash density. Um, so for example, as I talked earlier, we had the lane departure crashes. Um, we'll have that assessment, then we'll also be able to dig into, okay, is the crash density for runoff road right, runoff road left, or side swipe opposing, or is it our head-on crashes? Um, so the standardized scores, we bring everything back to, uh, truly it's an unlimited scale, but um, basically once you get above six, you're looking at things that are really, really outliers, and so, um, we bring it back to a standardized score where three is average or below. So anything below three um, is doing good. Anything above three means you're starting to get above the average. Um, values of five represent one standard deviation above the mean. Values of six represent two standard deviations above the mean. And so um, if there are no crashes uh, in a particular crash density category, you will receive a score of one. Um, and so it gets a little tricky, and some of our some of our higher uh, standardized scores tend to occur on our infrequent crash types, so our crashes with trains, our crashes with bikes and pedestrians, where we don't have a lot of those. Um, almost everybody's a one, and if you have one crash, you might end up being a, a four. Um, if you have two crashes, you might end up being an eight or a nine, just because we don't have the density of those crashes. And, uh, and a lot of this has to go with the, the distribution of the, the crashes. So let's take a look. We have a one mile segment. Um, I just went down to Highway 14, which is down around the Mankato area. A mile marker 109, I pulled up my table. Um, and I said, okay, well, 
Let me see what the lane departure score is there, because uh, our number one infrastructure category is keeping vehicles on the road. And so the lane departure score in that particular area was a five. So, you know what, it's about a standard deviation above. So maybe something we should have on our radar screen, maybe do an investigation. So I dig in there and I get the individual scores. So my run off the road lefts uh, had a score of five. My run off the road rights had a score of one. Um, my head-on crashes had a score of one. My side swipe opposing, so that's hitting the vehicle coming the other direction. You're just doing a glancing side swipe. It was a six. Um, and so that starts to get at, okay, so we have a problem with the vehicles crossing the center line. And they're either hitting other cars or they're making it all the way to the other side of the road. So what is it? Is it roadway geometric? Is it, you know, what is this? Is it inattention? It starts to paint that picture of what the root cause of our crashes are. And, uh, and so this, you know, again, starts to get at what things can we look at and then we can match up certain strategies or countermeasures to mitigate these things. <clears throat> so here's a, about a 12 mile segment of Highway 14 um, and you know this is just kind of a, a simply a screening tool that we look at and say okay on a mile by mile basis here's just a, a portion of our spreadsheet. As you can see you know we have our are uh, keeping the vehicles on the road, the run off the road right and left, head on crashes, side swipes, and you can kind of start to paint the picture of, okay, we've got some things going on down there for sure um, from the, the road departure or lane departure category that we should keep our eye on. Uh, that tabula data is nice if you know where mile marker 109 is in the state, but I can venture a guess that nobody here knows where mile marker 109 is besides me. So we're working on doing some things in Google Maps, and uh, we're having the ability to, to take that thing and, and plot it in a GIS environment. So um, the color scheme that we're using is basically green is good, yellow is about average to starting to deviate, and then red is bad. So what I did is I said, you know what, statewide, um, show me locations where my lane departure standardized score is above three, so anything that's above average. And uh, you know, on a statewide basis, you can start to see some of the yellow pop up. And you shouldn't see too many reds because that's you know, less than 3% of your, your sample size. So at a statewide basis, we hope we don't have a bunch of red showing up. We zoom in a little closer. Now we can get to that area, Highway 14 between Mankato and, and Owatonna. Um, your mile marker 109 happens to be in that, in that area. And so we can start to see on that corridor where things start to break down a little bit. So the, uh, the lighter colored green is, is where the, the number four starts. And then you can see as we get into Mankato, we get some oranges and some yellow starting to occur in there. So it, it starts to get at some of the root causes of what's going on. Um, we can also say, okay, well, show us where these run off the road left areas are. So it changed the query. And uh, as you can see, the map changed a little bit. And then we go run off the road right. And then we can go head-on crashes. And, and so again, it starts to just give us the ability to start diagnosing individual corridor performance. And then the last one here is where our side swipe crash is occurring. So um, you see the one area in green on there, that might be a pretty good indication of what our mile marker 109 is on Highway 14. Um, it was right in between Mankato and Owatonna. So the Road Smart tool, um, yeah, it, it starts to get us at some of the root causes of what's going on. And, and you know, we've got 75 different things to look at. We're benchmarking it. And so it, it starts to get at some root cause um, diagnoses. Um, and it does a lot better at trying to diagnose those things that the toolkit comes up a little short on looking at. You know, the bike and pedestrian crashes, the behavior related crashes. You know, we've used this on a preliminary basis to say, you know, where, where should we maybe look at doing DWI enforcement? You know, what counties, what corridors, where are our crashes at? Now, the other thing with some of the behavior things is sometimes behaviors don't result in, in crashes. And so um, having the ability to truly capture that, this is one piece of that pie because um, impaired drivers, unbelted drivers, aggressive drivers don't always cause crashes. And so we can't pull that into our analysis, but it gives us at least where the crashes are occurring, we can at least get that intelligence uh, as part of our evaluation for where we might consider going. Another thing that we can do with this is we're not, we don't have uh, predetermined segment lengths. So we aren't saying from mile marker 100 to 115, this is our predefined segment like the toolkit has. So 
This is a mile by mile basis. If we want to put a corridor together, we can simply add up all the standardized scores and then divide by it and get a corridor weighted average for each of the characteristics. So it's a lot more flexible. It allows us to do some apple to apple comparisons and, and try to get at that. And so, um, like the toolkit, this is looking back at where the crashes occurred. So this is good for kind of that whole reduction going after our high crash locations. So brings it back to this, this chart here and, and our fatal crashes are being reduced and, and they're, um, we're sustaining that reduction. Those last tools use 400,000 crashes in order to develop their logic. Well, if I took those 400,000 crashes away and said, now nah, you got to look at 8,500 crashes because we're going to look at just fatal and serious injury crashes. We don't have that plethora of data to develop some nice little standardized scores and we don't have a good distribution of crashes to look at. That really changes how we approach um, looking at things when we try to focus in at these fatal and serious injury crashes. And that's the whole basis for our systemic approach to safety. Um, when we look at fatal and severe crashes, um, they really are random or rare. Um, you know, 400 people getting killed a year is a travesty, but when we look at it, um, we've investigated thousands of intersections, thousands of curves, thousands of miles of road. And you know what, in this state, we don't have a dead man's curve. We don't have the killer corner where they can say somebody's killed at this particular location every year, and we've averaged one per year. It, it simply doesn't exist. And so looking for these hot spots or these black spots of where these crashes occur, um, our traditional measures like the toolkit and like the RoadSmart tool fall a little short in doing that. And so that's why we developed this systemic approach um, to help us get at how can we look at diagnosing these things um, when we don't have uh, a vast data set to draw from. And so what we start looking at is instead of looking at individual locations and looking at the crash types, we're going to flip that upside down. Or we're going to start looking at crash, light, crash types and investigating the characteristics of the location. And so this is what we've done. We've, we have a, a huge project that we're working on that's got national attention. We actually just won a, a national safety award um, a couple weeks ago for this effort, um, developing specific safety plans for county roads. And if you think about it, Half of, the, half of the fatal and serious injury crashes occur on the MnDOT trunk highway system. And, and the way this chart works here is the red numbers are our fatal and serious injury crashes, and the black numbers are our total crashes. And so what we can look at here, and, and this is crashes for basically every place except the Twin Cities metropolitan area. So we talk about crash types or crash problems in urban areas are substantially different than crash types in rural areas. Well, in Minnesota, uh, the major metropolitan areas of Twin Cities. Yeah, there's St. Cloud, yeah, there's Mankato, Rochester, Duluth, but those are, those are relatively small urban areas. And when we look at the, the roadway network in those areas, a majority of that is rural in nature. So this is our, our opportunity to take a look at our crashes that occur in a rural environment. And when you start looking at rural locations, the, the individual locations where these crashes are occurring at or truly are random. I've pulled up map after map after map and said, show me the fatal and serious injury crashes in 2002 compared to 2003, compared to 2004. And the dots just keep moving from, from different spots on there. So there's no rhyme or reason as to where these things are happening. So this is our, this is our attempt at trying to look at how can we get at doing something at those things because 40% of our crashes are happening on the local road network. 20% of our fatal and serious injury crashes are happening in cities and townships. 40% of our crashes are occurring on the state system. And so when we look at that, we've got a lot of opportunities. And so we've got to figure out how can we best get at these things. So our, our project we're working on with the counties, we started breaking that down and said, okay, well, on the county roads and on the county state aid highways, that's what CSAH stands for up there, um, are these urban crash problems or are they rural crash problems? And so when we think outside the Twin Cities metropolitan area, 83% our fatal and serious injury crashes are rural. Now, if you look right above that, our total crashes, only 60% of them are rural in nature. And so this is where we have to start using the data to help drive us, okay, if we start looking at things with fatal and serious injury crashes, what location should we be focusing on? 
it's not the downtowns of the small cities and in, in townships in rural Minnesota. It's those rural roads. And so, okay, well, if they're rural roads, and, and this was an interesting exercise. We went out and, and started doing these things, and we said, you know, we asked a township official, we said, uh, where do you think the problems are? And he says, oh, they're probably out in the country. You know, can't get an ambulance out there. There's a lot of reasons why people get killed out in the country. And he says, oh, I, I can buy that. He goes, but you know what the problem is? We're hitting deer. We're hitting bear. We're hitting animals. Oh, okay, well, let's take a look. So we said, okay, well, is that true or not? Well, yeah, you know what? Some people do get killed from hitting animals. 4% um, of our fatal and serious injury crashes occur. But should that be a substantial focus when 96% of our rural crashes don't involve animals? So again, we're just trying to define where we're focusing, where we're going to put our safety priorities. So we kind of say, okay, you know what? Animals probably aren't a key emphasis area. Um, and then so we start looking, okay, well, if it's rural, then maybe it's those rural intersections that nobody stops for. So we start breaking it down a little farther and we say, okay, about a third of our severe crashes in the rural environment are at intersections. About two thirds aren't. So what do we do? You know, and we keep breaking this down again and again and again, and, and trying to get down to where's our problem. In every one of the rural districts we've went to, we've always got down to this right-hand corner, which intuitively as an engineer, okay, curves, probably harder to navigate, yeah, you know, I expected an overrepresentation of fatal and serious injury crashes and curves. I just didn't expect this much of an overrepresentation. So we have our non-intersection related rural crashes. Um, majority of those are run off the road crashes. And half of those are tied to curved sections of roads. When we think about all the roads that are out there, um, majority of them are straight as an arrow. And so less than 15% of our overall roadway network is curved, but it has 50% of our fatal and serious injury crashes. And so if we want to start doing things to prevent crashes from occurring, maybe we should start looking at making some investments in our curves so that people can identify them, people can navigate them, people can, can you know, that seems to be the highest risk. When you think about, in the medical world, heart disease, you know, what are some key things that you can do to eliminate heart disease? Not be overweight, treat your high blood pressure, do those types of things. And so what we do is we start looking at, okay, so we have a problem with runoff the road crashes, especially on curves. We still, you know, there's still half of them that are occurring on our straight section of the road. So how are we going to get at these things? Um, like I said, the traditional approach has always been, okay, look for locations and figure out what's going on with crashes. Now we're going to look at the crashes and we're going to get the details at the locations they're occurring. So you can see that the, the first attempt here we got at was, okay, our curves are a problem. Um, we're still leveraging our ASHTO areas, ASHTO emphasis areas for our intersections that run off the road crashes. It still confirms that it's, it, it's a, an opportunity to make an improvement. We just need to look at it a little differently. And so <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves, especially when we're going to look at doing some things we want to cover lots of miles or lots of intersections is when we look at the entire network is every intersection equally at risk or is there a way where we can stratify that is every mile of road equally at risk or is there a way where we can say you know what the opportunity for an overweight person with undiagnosed high blood pressure um, who lives a sedentary lifestyle he's probably more at risk than having a heart attack than um, somebody that exercises daily and has their weight under control. And so is there a way where we can stratify our intersections and our roads to figure out what locations might be at higher risk? And I say yes, we can. And so if you believe that we can do a risk assessment on our roadway network, okay, how the heck do you do it? Where, where do you start? And, and that really is this new approach that we're, we've developed here in Minnesota and, and people are looking at nationally, and it's that whole systemic approach. As I talked about earlier, in the old days it used to be, you know what, if you have crashes, you have a safety problem. If you have no crashes, you don't have a safety problem. And, and what, I'm, what I'm here to tell you today is, you know, that's not necessarily the case because otherwise we would have been diagnosing our rural curves um, a long time ago and doing something about it. And so I'm, 
I'm here to tell you that just because you don't have crashes out in the road doesn't mean that the risk is not there for a crash to occur. And so what we need to do is we need to find those things to help us diagnose where are we at in the spectrum. Is there more risk or re less risk that's there? And that's why we're going to use these things called surrogates. You know, and so the heart disease example, some surrogates are weight, blood pressure, um, diet, lifestyle. Um, can we develop those things to help us look at our intersections and our segments of roads and say, you know what, the opportunity for these crashes to occur out there are higher on these roads. And, and I think that we've done a pretty good job of developing some surrogates. And I'm, I want to talk about what we've come up with. Curves, talk about curves and how they're overrepresented. Based on doing some research and some literature reviews, based on our own experience, here are five factors that we know contribute to curves. We looked at the crash data and we started looking at our curves that are out there. And there's certain volume levels um, and, and the crash data will tell us. You know, at each location, in each jurisdiction, we'll go in there and say, what's the volume of the roads at where these curves are happening? Um, we also look at the radius of the curve. And the radius curve is basically how sharp is it? Um, and, and, you know, initially people think, okay, the tighter the curve, the worse the crash. The wider the curve, uh, the more forgiving the crash is. And that's true to a certain extent. But if you think about these really sharp curves, they're usually in, in low speed or urban environments where you don't go too fast. And if you happen to run off the road in those curves, uh, you know, you might bruise your elbow, you might, uh, uh, you know, walk away with a minor injury, but you probably aren't going to be killed or seriously injured unless there's a pedestrian or bicyclist involved. So what we found is in doing this investigation with the curves is that it's not your real sharp curves and it's not your real wide curves, but it's your curves where you go going and you're about a quarter of the way in and uh-oh, I'm going too fast and I feel the force pushing me out on this curve and I just don't have enough time to decelerate and I lose control. I depart the road at a high rate of speed and then that's where your speed results in the, the severe and, and, and fatal injuries occurring. And so we looked at the radius and we've been able to plot out particular radius ranges that are more at risk. Um, by all means, if there's a crash history there, so if there's been a, a severe crash, um, we need to, to diagnose that or we need to say that's a risk factor because if you had a crash there before, unlike the stock market, I think that past performance might indicate future performance as well. And there's also some things about intersections within a curve, um, opportunities for conflicts and other things get hit. And the last thing is a visual trap. And, and that's a terminology or lingo that we use in the transportation industry. Um, what I've got down here is a picture of a visual trap. You're driving down that road, say you've been going straight for a long time. You've got a lot of things that reinforces that that road goes straight there. You've got telephone poles that are continuing down the way. You've got a, a township or a minor road that comes up here and actually hooks up at this intersection. If you're not paying attention, you're kind of on autopilot and you're going through and maybe it's dark out. Um, there's a lot of things that are telling you that, you know what, that road goes straight when actually, as you can see in this picture, it curves to the left. And so we go through and we look for areas where we have what we call visual traps. Just a lot of things that reinforce that, that the road's going straight. And so those are things that we can, we can improve on. As I said, we've looked at a lot of curves. Um, we looked at about, uh, I think we're up to about 18,000 curves. Um, this is a busy graph, but basically what I want to show you is we've got five bars under each of these radius categories. The bars on the right are your crash experience. The bars on the left are the percentage of roadway um, that fall in that category. So anytime we have an imbalance of the bars on the right being higher than the bars on the left, we have an overrepresentation of crashes. And so we start to look at the data here we kind of can, can see at about 500, uh, a radius of 500 feet, um, we start to get that imbalance where the bars on the right are substantially higher than the bars on the left. And we see that sustained all the way up until about 1,200 foot radius, and then it starts to dive off pretty good out here. And so again, that represents not the real sharp curves, not the real wide curves, but that area in between. And so we use this to help us diagnose, okay, this is probably a risk factor we need to look at when diagnosing our curves. So majority of our, our severe injury crashes fall within that 500 to 1200 foot radii, radii range. <clears throat> um, our segments of roads, so these are our, you know, our areas between our intersections or from intersection to intersection. We, we've got five factors that we know um, input or, or, or attributed with these crashes. 
Uh, number one's that volume range. Um, and, and as you can see down here, this is one of our uh, districts or area transportation partnerships. Um, we start looking again at the, the exposure, so the miles that have um, volumes of zero to 200 cars a day, 200 to 400, 400 to 600, and so forth on the county road network. And we look for that imbalance. So where do we have on our predominant crash type out there on our segments or run off the road? So where are our severe run off the road crashes occurring at? What volume ranges? And as you can see, we have an overrepresentation here. So again, we're using the data to help drive us as to, geez, where should we be making these investments? What should we be doing? Um, again, crash history is part of our, our diagnosis. Um, we also look at access density. A lot of times people think that you know, your number of driveways, uh, are, it's an urban issue, but there is a correlation between um, access density and uh, crash severity on a rural environment. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, with your field entrances and your fixed objects that go with that. And then we also have what's something that's called a critical curve, and that critical curve density. So the density of those 500 to 1,200 foot radius curves, if you're above your average or you're below the average. So just kind of trying to take into account exposure because you can run off the road on a curve, um, and this is just a chance to, to incorporate that into that methodology. And then the last one we have is, is things at intersections, and we've got seven different characteristics there. Um, on our segments, on our curves, we had volumes. At the intersections, we look at volume ratios. So it's that balance of is it equally as the major and minor road? Is it a 50-50 split? Is it a 90-10 split? And we look at the crash data to help us figure out what that ratio is. Um, we also know that intersections that are approached at skew angles, people tend to have, uh, our, our crash data reinforces that people have a bad experiences there. Um, it's overrepresented. So if our intersection is not at a 90 degree angle, we actually bring that into consideration. Um, if there's development close to the intersection, uh, that also contributes to crashes. You think about that, development usually equates to more vehicles, more vehicles equates to exposure, the probability of a crash happening is directly correlated with uh, the number of vehicles using it. And then uh, we also get into some proximity things. So. Um, Actually, right down the middle of the screen here is a railroad line. And so another thing we found out in our crash database is intersections close to railroads, man, they got a bad history. Um, and, and it's just one of the things that, that we struggle with. Um, and some of it has to do with just there's a lot of things competing. You know, you see the big gate for the railroad, you see the big flashing or unflashing sign, and you forget that 100 foot beyond that is a stop sign. You blow through the stop sign, and boom, you hit another vehicle. And so we have a proximity to a railroad crossing. And then we also have the distance that you've last had to comply with a traffic control device. And so you know sometimes uh, stop signs sneak up on you. If you've been driving on a road and you think that's been the main road for a long time and maybe you're on the county road network um, and you haven't had to stop for a while, all of a sudden you come to a major intersection with a trunk highway. Um, you know that, that uh, there's a correlation between the distance to the previous stop sign and, and our crash experiences. And so those are some of the things that were used to help us kind of diagnose um, where our problems are at. So what we do is we apply those surrogates, and this is just a sample counter that we've been working with. Um, we apply them, we come up with, with a ranking. And we said, you know what, the more characteristics you have, the higher the probability there is of a fatal and serious injury crash occurring. And we talk about that. That means our T-bone crashes, our angle crashes at intersections, and our road departure crashes um, on our segments of road and within our curves. And so this starts to give us a stratification as to where we might be able to, to invest and, and make uh, wise decisions to try to prevent those crashes from happening in the first place. Another interesting thing that we did with this is we went up to the toolkit and we applied the logic here as well. And so you know, these things also have the ability to do a good job of diagnosing um, high crash locations as well. Um, but it also pulls in some things where these two intersections, they haven't had a crash. And so our toolkit method, our crash density method might not come up with these things. But boy, they've got some of the characteristics that make this a, a strong candidate for a crash to occur in the future. And so. The systemic approach really looks um, for opportunities for us to do things on a system-wide basis. You know, this isn't an individual intersection by intersection, but you know, we're trying to do 
deploy a, a wide number of strategies um, that are low cost on a, a large system. And so we want to get a lot of bang for our buck. So we're not talking about putting interchanges in, putting signals in, putting turn lanes in. You know, we're talking about making sure we have good signing, good pavement markings. We've got the deployment of, uh, of good edge lines and maybe rumble strips to keep people on the road. Some things that we can cover a lot of miles with. Um, and the, the best thing about this is, is I love this approach because it, it should make me never have to answer this question, how many people out here have to die before we do something? You know, because like, we're trying to prevent those crashes from occurring in the first place. Um, um, you know, and uh, the methodology we think is pretty sound, you know, um, we're catching black spots and, you know, so that, that tells us that the root cause of, of crashes are being captured by uh, our systemic methodology as well. But we're struggling, you know. Uh, my management, um, they're supportive of this, but when I get out to the districts in the greater Minnesota where they don't have a lot of crashes and they're saying, Brad, you want me to do a safety improvement in a spot that hasn't had any crashes in 20 years? Um, so we still have some education to do and to get them to buy in on it, but I think, you know, as we, we keep chugging away at those traffic fatality numbers, I, I think that, uh, you know, we're going to have to get more and more creative on how we're going to try to identify opportunities to make safety investments. So then I, now it brings us to, okay, so now you've got some prioritization. What the heck are we going to do about it? And, and uh, you know, we developed this to kind of go along the food pyramid. Um, you know, when you're going up, you have lots of fruits and vegetables and not too much candy. Um, and this is kind of how we envision, you know, our, our things on the bottom of the screen here are low-cost things that we can do on a wide number of miles. Um, you know, we want to do that with our prevention program. We want to be able to, to get at those types of things. We start doing higher cost fixes at spot locations. Well, we, we better have a documented crash history before we go out there and and um, you know consider putting in an interchange or consider doing some other high cost deployments. Um, and so, you know, the the whole uh, scheme of things in terms of the prevention and reduction. That's not to say that we can't do some of these low cost things to help us reduce crashes. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it's the incremental thing. One of the biggest struggles we have is, is we work with people and they, they immediately, they want to go after the cookies, they want to go after the candy bars, they want to do that stuff, they want to do the high cost stuff because you know what, that's what we need. And, and we work with local officials, what do they want? Signals, interchanges, four lane divided roadways, things that cost millions of dollars. And when there's, there's a lot of strategies in between here that we can consider. And so, in general, to summarize, um, you know, safety is a pretty diverse topic. You know, we, we want to approach it from multiple angles. So, um, you know, we've always had a reduction program in our safety area in MnDOT, but we're, we're trying to deploy um, some, some things on a prevention basis. Um, and, you know, our focus is doing engineering things, but we want to make some strategic partnerships and collaborate and, and do some things, pass some good laws and have some policies. And, uh, you know, we have the methodologies uh, to identify the locations to make the improvements. Now there's also some tools that are being developed that can allow us to evaluate um, what potential solutions are out there. Things like the Highway Safety Manual, the Interactive Highway Safety Design Module, some things that can do a comparing and contrasting of expected crash reductions by certain strategies. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of logic into, into how we're trying to do these things. So with that... Um, I'll leave that stat up there because that's pretty impressive. And right now, as of today, 319 people were killed in Minnesota. Um, last year at this time, we we're at 376. We're about 60 down. Um, I think that come January, you're going to hear about us having another record year for traffic fatalities in the state. So um, I hope that uh, hope that, that occurs. But um, people in the country are looking at the numbers, saying, "How the heck are you doing that, Minnesota?" And, and we're going to keep on hopefully pushing it down and get to that, that zero deaths uh, goal here at some point in the future. So with that, uh, I'll open it up for any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, remember, you have to use the microphone if you have a question. Anyone have any? Uh, just with respect to the fatal rate, how does that compare to VMT in the state? I mean, that's the obvious thing that everybody's going to ask. So right. I think the, it might be obvious and ask it. <laughs> yep. The, uh, the VMT has been pretty flat over the last three or four years. Um, you know, and that's just been an overall trend. So our rates are going down as well. 
So it's yeah, the 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 VMT has been flat for about the last four years. This is a kind of a related question, but how do you guys control for the uh, the factors that MinDOT has control over in terms of the reduction in crashes? Like, I'm sure you have some kind of way of like weighting variables such that. For example, like more and more of the new cars have side impact airbags, and that probably reduces fatalities. But you know, that's not something that, that Midnot itself has power over. Right, and and that's where um, you know we do the things that we can. You know, we, we try to control the things we can have an impact on, um, and that's where we look to make some strategic partnerships with people. You know, in the industry, in the academic areas. Um, the, you know, the development of some of these collision warning systems, um, you know, were concepts and ideas that were out there and, you know, getting them into vehicle manufacturers and deploying those things, uh, it's about collaboration. That's why that multidisciplinary approach gets in of we'll do our part on the roadway. If we can make a partnership with somebody to do some things for in-vehicle technology, um, we're better off. And so um, that's that whole multidisciplinary approach try to take. Any more questions? Well, if not, will you please join me in thanking uh, our speaker, Brad, for his talk. Uh, again, next week, same time, same place, uh, we're going to have a talk uh, by Nicholas Guidici on uh, the blind interacting with the roads. Uh, I think that should be fairly informative. And I mentioned several other talks that are taking place. Uh, if any of you are interested, uh, there's a talk on uh, Connected Vehicle Program. Uh, which is going to take place uh, next uh, Tuesday. Uh, there's going to be a talk on GPS and in-vehicle technologies, which is going to take place next Wednesday. Just see me, and I'll give you the time and location. Thank you.